Welcome everyone to another exciting episode of Nikon TV. My name is Chris Okenick, your host, and last episode, we talked about all the headline features of the Z9. Well, this episode is still gonna be based on the Z9, but it's going to be looking at some of the Easter eggs, some of the things that, there's just so much to talk about with the camera last time, it just fell through the cracks. I know some of you are gonna to wanna to know some of this information, you're gonna to wanna to see some of the new menus, and you're also gonna to wanna to hear from some of our Nikon ambassadors. So we have two Nikon Canada ambassadors. We have Christian and Taku. Both of them will be coming on a little bit later on uh, to each talk about their um, uh, dealings with the camera and the short time that they had it, what they loved about the camera, why they're, they're so blown away by it, but we will get to them afterwards. We're gonna start off with Easter eggs, because like I said, there is so much going on with this camera that you just cannot talk about every single feature in just one outing. I talked for a long time last episode and I still wasn't able to get through all of it. So let's get started. I have a whole list here. I'm gonna get through as many as I can. Uh, so let's kind of get started with this list because there's a lot of pretty cool uh, and interesting th things here. Okay. so. What I'm gonna start off showing you is actually a brand new menu. This menu is dedicated purely for all the network options. So as you can see here, we have our airplane mode, which is turned on right now. Uh, we have our uh, wired LAN, we can connect to our smart device because we have very easy um, capability to go and just share photos or remote control your camera using SnapBridge. You can connect to your computer, to an FTP server. There's a lot you can do. I'm not gonna go through everything here, but I really want to show you that there is a dedicated menu now for your network options. Uh, the second thing I actually wanna talk about is this new type of menu system. So when you look at this here, airplane mode, before with any other camera in our lineup, you would have clicked to get into that menu and then you would have turned it on or off. Okay, well that works, but now it's just a very simple toggle. So now it's off and now it's on. So very, very, very simple to go through and just toggle it on or off. There's no need to jump into an extra menu system. So this is a really just kind of small progression of our uh, camera system that I think um, a lot of people are actually gonna really enjoy. Okay, so what's next? All right, so let's get into some of the meat and potatoes. So last time we talked, um, and I say we, um, uh, Michelle and I talked about the sensor shield. So this is a, a shield that goes up over top of the camera um, that tries to go and protect from dust, uh, any other issues that might come in uh, when you're changing lenses in the field. Now, some people may wanna know how you actually turn that on or off in the uh, menu system. And here it is, you go into the setup menu and by clicking shutter behavior at power off, you can go and have shutter closes or shutter does not close. Um, I personally like shutter closes. There's no real reason why not to have that on. Uh, but the one thing to keep in mind is even though we are calling it a sensor shield in the menus, it is shutter behavior, or sorry, a sensor shield. Um, uh, this is called a shutter behavior at power off. And one reason, I don't think we really talked about it last time too much. One reason why um, we have this feature in this camera, but we don't have our actual mechanical shutter opening and closing um, to go and try and stop dust in our other cameras is as strong as a shutter is in the vertical direction. It's very lightweight, usually carbon fiber, very, very strong in that vertical direction. But that's not what you're protecting against. You're protecting against accidental contact. If somebody accidentally scrapes a knuckle on it as you're changing lenses, that will most likely spell the end of your mechanical shutter because as durable as they are in the up and down um, axis, being pushed horizontally, they are a little bit more on the frail side because they have to be so lightweight and so uh, quick in their movements. So a regular shutter that is possibly gonna be contacted. Uh, I'm not sure about that. The, the amount of accidental repairs that could come about because of that is, is problematic. So to deal with that, we came up with the sensor shield that is more durable, that can actually take a little bit more contact. And not only will the uh, sensor shield itself try and stop dust, but if dust still does get in, because where does the dust go if the dust is on that sensor shield? 
Well, when that sensor shield goes away, it's now right on the sensor. So we have dual um, coatings on our sensor to try and make cleaning it that much easier. We have a fluorine coating that's designed specifically to help clean, but you also have a electroconductive coating. And that coating is designed just to try and not allow dust to actually contact and stay on your sensor. Okay, so uh, we've talked about network menu. We're on um, number four. So we're gonna talk about shutter sound. Now, this is an electronic only camera, which means technically there is never any shutter sound, but there is a, a I'll call it a fake, um, an electronic shutter sound that, that is an audible cue for you to know that the camera is actually taking a photo. So let's actually find what the different options are for camera sounds. There we go. So for camera sounds, you can have the shutter sound on or off. Off, and when I go and fire right now, you can't tell, but I'm taking photos. Um, and then you can go and turn that on. You can turn the beep on or off. That's if you're in the menu system, if you're using the back of the LCD screen. And then you can also change the volume. So the volume can be high, it can be medium, or it can be low, which is usually what I have the camera set to. And then for your menu options, when it does go and um, uh, activate, you can go and change the pitch. So the pitch can be high or low. So those are just a few things that some people may be curious about uh, when it comes to, well, if it's an electronic shutter only, are there any camera sounds? Or can I turn them off? Can I turn it on? And the answer is yes to all of that. Uh, you would just go into the camera sounds option under the setup menu. Now, right below camera sounds, there's a silent mode. Okay, well, why is there a silent mode if you just turn off the camera sound? Is, doesn't that make the camera silent? Well. Yes, but our engineers have actually gone a little bit further. So not only um, does silent mode go and kill the um, electronic sound when you go and take a photo, but it will go and deactivate any of the uh, beeps of when you are actually in the menu or using the live view. So that's good as well. So th that's done all in one step. But it also makes our VR quieter. Not only the lens VR, so the actual VR if you have a lens such as this, uh, 100 to 400 Z, which I will be talking about in the next episode. Um, if you do have a lens that has a lens VR, it'll actually quiet down that VR motor, but it also quiets the IBIS system as well. So it really tries to take a look at the entire system and quiet that whole thing down, not just removing the sound of the shutter itself. Okay, so what's next? Uh, now we are going to go and I know it's here somewhere. Is it below or above? It is above. Okay, so uh, the finder display size. What this is, depending on your um, use of the camera, your needs, um, a lot of people want the viewfinder when you're looking through it, the electronic viewfinder, to take up the entire size of the viewfinder. Makes sense but there are some people who need a little bit of extra distance uh, to actually be able to focus, to see. Maybe they have large glasses that don't allow them to get very close to the actual EVF itself. Whatever the reason might be, some people might want the EVF to be a little bit smaller, just to allow them to see the entire frame. So what you're able to do is to go into finder display size, and within here you can go small, and that's automatically gonna go and crop the, well, sorry, sorry. I take that back. It's not going to crop. It's going to, to reduce the size of the EVF as you actually look at it. Okay, so even though right now in my list it's number eight, um, this is probably up there as almost number one for me in terms of things that I'm excited to talk about with this camera because it really shows how... Um, how much our engineers looked at the entire usage, not of the camera, but also the users as well, and who's gonna to wanna to use this camera and how to make things easier for them. So, very long-winded. How do I uh, shorten that? Well, I'm gonna go and jump into the photo shooting menu and go to raw recording. Now, once you're in raw recording, usually with, uh, let's say, Z7 II, you not only have the ability to choose whether you want 14-bit or go down to 12-bit, but you also can go uncompressed, lossless compressed, or compressed. Okay, so you have all of those options. 
whoa, whoa, whoa wait a second, because we're forgetting. We also have the ability to record raw large or raw medium or raw small. Raw medium gets a Z72 file down to about 25 megapixels and a raw small gets it down to about 11 megapixels, I think off the top of my head. So you're throwing away resolution for the benefit of a smaller file size because there are a lot of shooters out there who don't necessarily always need 45 megapixels. Well, that's where the genius of this new raw recording option comes in. Now, I will say before we even get into it, we have completely gotten rid of raw medium and raw small, and you no longer have the option of choosing between 14-bit and 12-bit. You only, if you're shooting raw, get 14-bit recording. Whoa, whoa, whoa. How does that make sense for a lot of our users if they don't want 45 megapixels, but we've gotten rid of the ability to reduce their, mega, uh, their, their amount of megapixels that they're uh, recording? And we've gotten rid of 12-bit, which was one of my favorite things to go and activate in the camera to go and decrease file size. How does this make sense? It will in just a second. So when we go into raw recording, this is the only option you now have. You can go and choose lossless compression. You can choose high efficiency star, or you can choose high efficiency. Now, lossless compression is the highest quality next is high efficiency star and then high efficiency. Now, how does this solve everybody's problem? Well, the amazing thing is um, roughly, and this, this obviously changes as to the scene you're shooting and your settings and all sorts of other things, but roughly lossless compress is gonna get you about 50 to 60 megabytes uh, per file. Okay, then when you go high efficiency star, that gets you from about 25 to 35 megs all right, so we're talking half the file size. Well, I'm not gonna complain about that. Then if you go down to high efficiency, that's gonna get you two thirds. That's gonna be between about 15 and 22 megs. So what we've done is we've given the photographer the ability to reduce their file size, similarly, almost identically to what the raw medium and raw small used to be, but they're getting 14-bit raw um, bit depth, and they're always getting 45 megapixels. So the resolution is there, the bit depth is there, and they're recording everything that they could possibly want at the file size that they want. Where's the downside? Well, to be totally honest, I haven't found one yet. Um, similar to 12-bit versus 14-bit, yes, technically there is a, an improvement going and shooting 14-bit, in real world usage, when you're not at absolute base ISO, I could never see it. I, I never ever could. And very similar with this, I've done a bunch of testing. Um, one of our Nikon Canon ambassadors, Michael, has done some testing as well. And going through his images, going through my images, I cannot tell the difference between lossless compressed, high efficiency star, and high efficiency in terms of resolution, in terms of sharpness, in terms of dynamic range. In certain conditions, I'm sure there might be, but from all the testing I've done, I'm keeping my camera set to high efficiency star from this point on, and I am gonna reap the benefit of full 45 megapixels at 14 bit and shooting at half the file size that I normally would, and I'll be happy. So that's why I'm so happy with that um, option because it really can benefit so many different types of users, and it's something completely different than we've ever done before. All right, so number nine on our list. Okay, so let's now jump down a little bit further in the photo shooting menu. And this is gonna be talking about subject detection because uh, if you guys all remember the last episode when I talked about subject detection, I said that there was nine different subjects. There was humans, there was animals, and then there was vehicles. Well, for whatever reason, you may want to only um, go and detect humans or animals or vehicles, whatever the option might be. And this is the menu option that you go to if you want to very specifically only detect those ones. So you can either have it set to auto, which is probably what I would recommend almost all the time. You can go in uh, only uh, detect people, only detect animals, only detect vehicles, or you can go and turn subject detection off entirely. Uh, there are some people who may wanna go and utilize this, but for me, I can tell you, I'm gonna keep the camera on auto pretty much all the time, to be totally honest with you. Okay, so what now? Now we're gonna talk about some 
video spec. So this is number 10. Now, um, this is mainly just for the, for the video nerds out there who want to see through the actual menu itself, some of the resolution, some of the frame rates, and I'm just gonna quickly go through all of those just to kind of give you guys an idea what is uh, available. So if you go into the frame size and frame rates, I'll jump to the top here. So this is 8K, so it shows you the resolution at 30 frames per second. Now, all of these here, they're just um, uh, made easy to understand at 30p, it's not actually 30p, it's 29.997, whatever it is, and it's not 24p, it's 23 point dot dot dot. So um, we have 8K at 30p, 8K at 24p, then we go down to 4K, we're at 120p, 60p, 30, 24, and then if you do still want even a lower resolution, you can go 1080p at 120, 60, 30, and 24. So that's all the resolution sizes and frame rates that you have available um, in the Z9. Now, this is where I think a lot of people are gonna get excited because you can go and record 8-bit. So this is what all of our cameras can record internally with the exception of the um, Z9. Um, uh, but in the Z9, you get an MP4 option, which is H.264, or you get an MOV option, which is H.265, but we now have the ability to record internally to the Z9, 10-bit, um, uh, with a couple different options. So you can go H.265, 10-bit, MOV, or you can go ProRes 422HQ, both of them internal. Now that's amazing. Now you see this little SDR on the right side of the frame there. Well, if I click the right uh, of the D-pad, this is actually gonna bring me into a secondary menu option where I can go and select whether I wanna record the standard dynamic range or do I want hybrid log gamma or do I want N log. Very simple to do, not kind of jumping around through the menus, really, really easy. And you can go and do uh, something similar. You, can, you don't have HLG, but under ProRes, you can go and select SDR or N log as well. So that was for the, for the video nerds who wanted to kind of get a feeling for uh, what the different options are, what the menu system looked like for the uh, frame rates, the codecs, and the resolutions. Alrighty, so uh, we've done the video. That was number 10, we're up to 11. So one of the amazing things on the, of the camera is its speed. You can go and shoot at 20 frames a second, raw, JPEG, doesn't matter, but some people don't need 20 frames per second. So what do we have as a way to customize that? Well, if we go to, uh, we're gonna go to shooting and display in the custom setting menu. We're gonna go D1 and we're gonna go continuous shooting speed. Now we have two different options. We have high speed and low speed. You have CH and CL on the top of the uh, dial here. So if you're in continuous high, you can either choose 20, 15, 12, or 10. But if you're in low speed and you want even more options, you can go all the way from one, two, three, four, five, six, to eight, to 10 frames a second. So you have a lot of different ability to change and customize the uh, drive speed of the camera based on what it is you're actually looking to, uh, to do and, and shoot. Okay, so after that, we're now getting into something that I really wanna talk about because this is kinda cool and I, it, it doesn't, if you go down to D10, warm display colors, that doesn't really tell you much. It really doesn't. It, it tells you, okay, so you might get slightly warmer. Well, no, this is actually for when you're shooting night photography. So if you're in night photography, you're shooting with the stars, let's say, and your eyes are adjusted to the red, you only have red headlights or, or flashlights around, so you don't wanna go and kill your, um, uh, your, your, your night vision, that is where D10 comes in. So if we go in here, Instantly, as I jump into warm display color options, when I go and select mode one, you instantly see everything turns to that red. Now, the difference between mode one and mode two is mode one means all menu, all viewing options are shown in red. So that means when you're looking through the viewfinder, your actual scene is completely bathed in, in red as well, which will make it a little bit more difficult to see in some situations, but it will help your overall um, uh, night viewing. So it kind of depends on you. When you go into mode 
two, this means that all your menu options have this red and all of the infographics overlaid on top of your EVF or the LCD screen will still be red, but your actual view, what you're seeing through the electronic viewfinder or the LCD will be shown as a regular real-time view. So you get to choose which one actually suits you the best. And I will turn that off so I can actually see it. Now, I'm gonna, I have only a couple left and I'm gonna burn through them pretty quickly because I know that you guys wanna be hearing from Christian and Taku. So um, 13 is I want to go and talk about your customizing of either the LCD screen on the back of the camera or the EVF, you can do them independently. Now, a lot of people I've heard say, okay, well, I want the histogram on all the time, or I want the virtual horizon on all the time, or I want the virtual horizon and the histogram on at the same time. Well, you're in luck. So I'm gonna go into the uh, custom viewfinder, and these are your different options. So you have your display one, two, three, four, you can toggle them on and off if you want to, um, but within each one of them, you can go and really mine down and say, do you want just the simple option? So that's usually the information on the bottom. The detailed option is the stuff on the top. Then you can go and turn on the virtual horizon. You can go and turn on your histogram. You can go and turn on your framing grid and even your center indicator. So there's a lot that you can go and customize exactly what you want. And not only that, but you can also separate from the EVF to the LCD on the back of the camera. Okay, and last option. This is something that, again, a lot of people have asked for. And when you look at the back of the camera, um, it is different from our uh, other high-end DSLRs in that our high-end DSLRs have a dedicated lock autofocus button. And some people uh, shooting with the mirrorless cameras want something similar to that. Now, we still don't have a dedicated lock button, but we have a feature of the camera that works exactly like it. And I actually like it a little bit better because it's a little bit less of a moving part, less things to go wrong. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna jump into F controls. We're gonna go to F4 for control lock, and then under control lock, you have the ability to go in, lock your shutter speed, your aperture, or your focus point. Now, when you use this in combination with custom controls, that's really where it takes it to a new level. So if I go into here, uh, you'll, you can actually see that I've already set uh, function button four, that's the button on the back of the camera, uh, to be the lock button. Now. When I go and um, let's say I turn into photo mode here. Okay, so I'm completely black, just so you can get a, a feeling for it. Um, what I want to do is right now, I can go and move my autofocus point any which way I want. Okay, well, what happens when I push and hold that FN4 button and then I hit the D-pad either left or right? Focus point selection locked. And now when I go and try and move that, it tells me, oh, no, 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 you've locked it. Unlock it, push the button, uh, hit the left or right of the D-pad, and you're all set to go. And you can go and move your um, autofocus point any which way you want, and then right back in the middle, just with the press of an OK. Uh, now you can go and uh, you'll, if you look at the bottom of the screen, you'll see my shutter speed is now locked and my aperture is now locked as well, and now they're unlocked. So you can go and use any one of those three. To be totally honest, the only one that a lot of people are gonna be util utilizing is the uh, autofocus lock, just because it is such a, a used feature in our DSLRs, and we've now brought it to our Z9. Okay, so that was a lot. I went through a ton of information there. Uh, hopefully you guys found those Easter eggs useful. Uh, there was quite a few of them in there. Uh, I tried to kind of pick and choose some of my favorites. There's, to be honest, more that I could talk about, but uh, I don't want a four hour long episode because it's not just about me. We are going to now bring in Christian. Christian obviously uh, has been one of our uh, Nikon Canon ambassadors for a long time. Um, He's gonna go and talk about some of the extreme um, sports that he was shooting with the camera, some of the wildlife, some of the portraiture studio type of environments he was shooting in. Uh, both him and Taku did not have the cameras for very long. I, I will um, tell you that they had a very, very short window with the cameras, but they both made the most of it. So let me go and talk to them uh, right now. Let me go and turn off the Z9, and let's find out what Christian thought. Welcome, Christian, back to Nikon TV. 
Hey, thanks so much, Chris. It is awesome to be here and uh, some exciting things to talk about. Oh, uh, well, and, and that's kind of the, the fun aspect of this is we've obviously known about the camera for a little bit of time now and we've both got to play with it, but now we can actually talk about it. And that for me is the amazing thing is because I know I was blown away by the camera almost as much as you, I think. And getting to actually talk to people about it is, is one of the most fun things for me. And I know that you've just been chomping at the bit to be able to show the images, to talk about it with people. So I know that this is really exciting for both of us. So exciting, so exciting. And yeah, the camera, I mean, I know, you know, it's it's been a while uh, since a, a flagship uh, mirrorless. Uh, well, so, well di all right, it's been a while since a flagship DSLR, but it's yeah. the first uh, flagship mirrorless. And I mean, it, it doesn't dis disappoint. It is absolutely incredible. I was blown away, so can't wait to talk about it. <laughs> okay, so, so let's kind of jump right in then. Um, I really want to kind of talk about autofocus and maybe the speed of the camera a little bit. And for anybody who knows you, uh, I know my, myself, when I heard that you were going to be doing a whole bunch of extreme sports, whether it was uh, mountain biking, uh, dirt bikes, that did not surprise me at all because not only did it fit with the camera and what it was capable of, but it fit right into your portfolio too because your, your ability to grab amazing athletes, and to go out and shoot them. It just kind of fit really, really perfectly. So can you kind of maybe talk about the autofocus when you were tracking these really, really fast moving subjects? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, sports has always been one of my favorite things to photograph. And, you know, I live out here in the Rocky Mountains, so I wanted to basically take both of those elements and, and photograph some professional athletes, you know, in sort of extreme sports conditions, which is also a great test for any camera because you have, you have so many different, uh, you know, variables to deal with. Uh, you have weather, you have all sorts of different things. And in this situation with the uh, motocross, you know, the athlete was wearing a helmet, goggles, so I didn't know, you know, how eye detect autofocus was gonna work. Um, and yeah, I, I basically found at 20 frames per second, I could not miss a shot. Like everything was, was just, absolutely perfect focus. Um, I shot most of my shots wide open because I wanted to avoid any kind of distracting elements in the background. So that made it even more difficult. I basically took the camera and put it through the most difficult subject or difficult scenario possible that I could come up with. Um, and it, it, uh, it, you know, blew away my expectations. Um, yeah. And I, I think, um, you know, one of the other things with the autofocus that surprised me because I've always been kind of, uh, despite, you know, what a, lo a lot of other people shoot, I like sort of a single point or a small point. And I, and I, and the camera of course did extremely well in single point. However, the, some of its new features, uh, where it can use a, a smaller point, but the AI intelligence to kind of decide if it's a face or it's an animal, uh, or it's eyes that just put it over the top. I literally could not miss a focus point and I was so impressed. Yeah, I think that's one of the things that we're, we're slowly starting to see acceptance of because I know yourself, I know a lot of other uh, pro photographers who've been shooting for years almost have that like, well, I've been doing this for so long. I know better than any camera. And to be totally honest, up until this camera, I would probably have agreed with you. I would have said, Christian, you can nail focus um, on a Z7 II better than letting the camera do it. Even maybe on a D6, you're, you're more capable than letting the camera take a little bit more of the reins. But with the Z9, with the, the deep learning algorithms that we've really programmed into it, I, uh, I, I think we're gonna see way more people just really surrendering some of the control to the camera because it really is so good no matter what you throw at it. It, it sure is, and, and you know, the fact that it, um, you can select different sizes for the AI to kind of focus in on, and then it will actually, depending on how um, accurate it feels the scenario is, it'll actually zoom in on that and give you a more accurate thing. I, I noticed that when I was looking through my images after, and it, it just, I mean, to be honest, it only took me about an hour to decide that I was gonna switch basically, uh, mostly permanently from uh, my single point uh, or, or uh, small cluster scenario to the AI small cluster. So it definitely was really impressive. And in a situation like motocross, um, that's where having the versatility of being able to adjust the size of the, uh, the AI cluster was really useful too, because when an athlete was coming off a jump, I was able to actually use a bigger uh, a point because when they come off a jump, you're, they're coming off blind and you can't actually see where they're jumping. And so to have a bigger point, so it can kind of dial in and zoom in for you um, on the eyeballs or on the face was really, really useful. 
Yeah, and and I I purposely when when we gave you the camera, we, there's not I I couldn't tell you everything about the camera. It was more of a kind of closed package. Here you go, play with it and find out for yourself. But I purposely didn't go through a, a, like every single one of the autofocus options because I wanted to see how organically you found the new system to be. And I just the I think the the minute you told me how in love you were with the uh, wide area large, I was like, okay, he switched, that's it. I, I, think, I think I've got him, I think I've got him. And it's it just a testament to how good and how intelligent the camera really is. It, it absolutely is, yeah. And, and having the new capabilities too that you can, you can uh, select that it's an animal or you can select that it's a face or you can have auto select. I thought that was really great too. And actually I found auto select worked amazingly well. So for any subject, so that, that even pressed me more because I definitely, I tried to be discerning there and tried to trick it. And, uh, and it definitely, uh, um, it did really, really well with it. And, and the last thing I wanted to say is I did also shoot a lot of video, a lot of handheld video and just, how the autofocus tracked my subjects and just the ability to, to change all those little settings. Like there's just so many little pro tweaks, which I love um, that, I can, that I can play with and tweak and just basically anything that I envision in my shot, I can basically make the camera do because it just has so many more features to be able to accomplish that. Yep, yep, I, I totally agree with all of that. Now you didn't just shoot in really good conditions because the, the, the motorbike uh, was was pretty good uh, lighting conditions. You also shot some more studio work. You did some amazing uh, uh, portraits of a couple, um, uh, well, one of them was a dancer, other ones were, what, what, they, they're what, rope? Uh, it was what, almost what like, they, it's like they, they do straps. Um, so it's like almost like strap aerials. So they're hanging from straps and they're doing aerials, almost like Cirque du Soleil kind of stuff. And they're really amazing athletes in this really cool gym where they do this really unique training uh, in, in Calgary. I just wanted to do, I mean, we had, uh, I only had the camera for one week, so it wasn't a long time. Uh, as usual, we had uh, smoke out here because of nearby forest fires. So there was, the conditions changed by the minute. Um, and so I wanted to have a safe bet that we had uh, an indoor uh, shooting location. And, uh, you know, this one, it was super fun because, uh, and, and also super technical because um, I had all sorts of first to, to kind of deal with with the camera in real time. So I had to see if uh, it worked with high speed trigger with my Broncolor studio strobes. I had to see how it would work with uh, my continuous light sources, you know, et cetera, et cetera. And so uh, in that uh, specific scenario, I was shooting with my uh, Broncolor uh, studio lights at basically 10 frames per second at least. That's about how fast my studio strobe could go on that flash. And then I switched to the continuous light where I went from shooting 100 ISO to 3200 ISO. And at 3200 ISO and in really low light, um, I wanted to see how the autofocus would perform, especially while the athletes are spinning around on these straps. And as they're doing that, of course, the focus point is changing like very, very, very quickly. And at some points they're spinning very fast. And so, um, yeah, the camera, it handled it extremely well. I was shooting at one one thousandth of a second. Uh, and uh, I think for most of those continuous light shots and uh, it did it extremely well. And for those of you wondering, the high speed uh, trigger also worked and I was able to shoot even faster than a thousandth of a second, which really surprised me without, uh, because it's, it's so new, right? The camera was just in prototype stage. I didn't know if that was gonna work, uh, but it did, it was awesome. <laughs> now, switching from action to low light, to let me talk about the EVF for a little bit because this is one of those things where, like I'm, I'm talking all the time now about our dual stream technology where we have a direct feed from the sensor directly to the EVF where almost every other camera has a single pipeline of data that takes the, um, uh, the EVF recorded data and the still images all in one pipeline. So you're not getting a true uh, blackout free. There's gonna be repeated frames. There's gonna be a little bit of stuttering sometimes. So with our dual stream technology, I've seen it, whether it's shooting birds, whether it's shooting planes, 
but it's just so easy to go and, and follow your subject. Uh, I'm gonna be showing uh, here a shot of, your, um, of a bird sequence that you were able to shoot. And people have to keep in mind, this isn't you shooting at like two, 300 millimeters. You're at, I think, almost 700 millimeters. You're with a teleconverter on here. So you're, you're really, really zoomed in on the bird. And that at the easiest of, or the, at the um, uh, best of, of shooting scenarios is gonna be tough. How did you find the EVF when you were tracking these moving subjects? Whether it's the bird, whether it's the, the motocross, and good light, bad light, was there any, any difference that you really saw when you were uh, shooting? Absolutely, absolutely, a crazy difference. I mean, night and day difference. I mean, and uh, I mean, definitely akin to like a D6, feeling like literally I couldn't miss a shot. Um, I think what, but, but this, um, and, and, and also looking through an optical viewfinder, it felt like I was looking through an optical viewfinder for the first time since I've been shooting mirrorless. And that's a really big deal. You know, I've always prided myself on with sports photography or wildlife, being able to see the moment, not just spray it with the, um, you know, frames per second motor drive, uh, you know, and I like to be able to see the moment, capture the moment and follow through with the frames per second. And I always felt like with mirrorless, I, I struggled being able to see that moment. And that struggle is no longer because I, I, I really can see it. Uh, it's, it's, it's amazing. I feel like I was so connected to the subject. I could see that moment and then I could basically just, uh, you know, get the shot and follow through perfectly. And that way I'm able to follow the shot before uh, and then shoot. But now um, there's no blackout as well. So that's a really unique experience. So really you, you don't even have to worry about sort of that, that shutter or that, you know, that, that sort of instant of blackout feel. You literally can just sit there and look through like you're looking through uh, a monocular or something like that. And it's, <laughs> it's, uh, it's an amazing feeling. I, I, and I also love just all the pro features that even go along with that, like the camera has the ability to change your display more than any camera I've ever seen, including just nothing on the display. So it almost looks like you're just looking through a scope. And I found that really cool, really Sorry. helpful. Uh, and uh, um, yeah, I was definitely uh, super impressed with that. Yeah, I actually just went through. So. Um... The, the, the episode, today's episode that you're a part of, it's actually Easter eggs. So uh, I went through about eh, 13, 14 of the, my favorite Easter eggs, and one of them was going through the EVF uh, customizability, all of the different things you can take off or that you can put on. And I think a lot of people are gonna really enjoy that. Um, and one of the things that I think people are gonna have to really kind of play with the camera and see for themselves is this instantaneousness with the Z9. Because when you look at the specs, by the specs, by when we talk about the resolution of the actual EVF, it is gonna look similar or identical to a Z7 II or a Z6 II. So people coming from those cameras, they're really gonna have to um, realize it is not the same experience as going from those cameras to this one. This dual stream technology, our real live viewfinder, it really does set it really far ahead um, than anything we've ever had and anything I've ever actually shot with uh, in the mirrorless realm. So um, I'm, I'm really, really excited for people to get out and actually uh, play with the camera and pick it up and see what it's capable of. Uh, Krishna, I'm gonna say thank you very, very much for, for uh, dropping by today, for letting everybody in on kind of some of the behind the scenes on as to what you thought of your the camera when you were shooting with it. Uh, what I'm gonna do is, uh, I'm not gonna give you any more words because you and I, if you open your mouth one more time, we're just gonna keep talking for the next six hours. So I'm not gonna allow us to, to talk anymore. What I'm gonna do is all the viewers at home, I'm gonna go and jump straight to Taku. Uh, Taku also had the camera and we're just gonna jump right in with him and uh, see what he thought of it. Christian, thank you very much for, for coming by and Taku, uh, here we go. And welcome, Taku, to Nikon TV. Thank you so much for, for coming on today. Thanks for having me, actually. I'm really glad to be here. Oh, that's, it's, it's great to be able to talk to so many of our ambassadors about this new camera, because I was just talking to Christian uh, before this. Uh, we just did the, 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 his previous interview and jumped right here. And I got to tell you, I am so excited to be able to talk about this camera with, with people. So I know that every time you and I have kind of talked about it a few times, you've just kind of seemed to get a little bit more and more excited about it as well. So it's great that we're finally able to, to discuss it with people and kind of talk about how great it is. 
Yeah, um, well, first of all, I have to thank you for the opportunity to test out the camera. And I just had a ball with it. It was just so much fun to play around with it. Uh, and the fact that it can pretty much do anything that uh, I, I, you know, I, uh, I tried to do with it, it, it was amazing. And it was just flawless. And um, I'm just so excited to be able to use it in the future for, all, uh, for and putting it into my my own workflow from here on in. Well, that, that's kind of where I'm, I'm curious how it's going to fit into your, your, your I'll call it your gear closet. Um, because, uh, and I hope you're okay with me making this, this parallel, but you're a very versatile photographer. There's not much that you, as a photographer or even videographer, aren't willing to go and tackle. And I think that the Z9 kind of fits really nicely with that because it's somewhere along the same lines. It doesn't matter if you're doing landscape work, sports, portraiture, architecture, it can pretty much do anything. So I'm kind of curious how that, how you kind of envision it uh, in the future, uh, either will it fit into your gear closet and or how many of them are going to fit? <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, so you mentioned the versatility of the camera and that's actually one thing that I really appreciate because uh, I do do a lot of different genres, uh, primarily events, uh, festivals around the city, uh, I do editorial portraits as well. And then for those of you uh, who do follow me on Instagram, I do a lot of nature and landscapes uh, as, in addition to all of that as well. So to be able to have one single tool um, and to be able to create so many different things from it, um, it's just a dream. Uh, it's a great camera that uh, will definitely be in my bag. Um, and in accompaniment, I guess you could say with the Z7 II, because the Z7 II is a smaller form factor, uh, which does play uh, into effect when, I guess, when you're out hiking out in the mountains or just here out in the city um, or whatnot, and you want to just carry something light, and that's probably when I'll take the Z7 II out. Uh, but, um, you know, for festivals, when I'm out, uh, when I need the, the speed, uh, as well as the, the silent photography, uh, then definitely uh, the Z9 will come out. And, and while that is out, uh, I'll be you know, very comfortable knowing that I'll still be able to take epic landscape photos uh, at the venue if I need to at that point as well. So very good uh, and reassuring from a photographer's point of view. Yeah, it's, it's a little bit different. People, I think we're more used to our flagship cameras, the D6 being a more niche type of, uh, of camera, where you wouldn't, I guess I'll say, you, you had a much more specific uh, usage for it. You would only kind of bring it out in those extreme situations. But now, the Z9, uh, it literally does anything. And kind of your, your one point of, it is obviously a little bit larger with an integrated grip than a Z7 II with no grip. So that, that could be a differentiator for, for a lot of photographers out there when they are kind of trying to decide which one to take with them, which one fits uh, better for them, uh, overall usage. Um, not only on the still side, but also on the video side as well. And you don't do just stills. You, you also uh, do a, a decent amount of uh, video work as well. That's right. Uh, yeah, so uh, I, I will admit video is a little bit new to me, but it's something that has piqued my curiosity over the past couple of years. So I've been dabbling with it. And uh, when I had the Z9, um, I did try out the video capabilities of it and, and it was so fun. Um, as much as the 8K 30 frames per second is a dream for a photographer or for a video photographer, a videographer, uh, I actually really like the, um, the 4K 120 frames per second, the slow motion, uh, just to be able to handle 120 frames per second. That's just buttery smoothness in terms of video footage. Uh, to get that much detail in 4K resolution is just amazing. Um, and I gave you a video uh, example at one point where uh, I shot a, um, a great blue heron who was hunting for food in, in uh, one of the many lakes of Algonquin Park. And uh, I managed to capture it, uh, dive into the water, uh, hunting and capturing its, uh, its prey. And just to be able to see the uh, exact moment when 
the, the hair and dives right into the water. The splash in the water, the details, the details of the hair at that point, uh, it's just tremendous and it's, it's great. And uh, it's one of the reasons why I always like slow motion to begin with is because um, you're able to see details and expressions and moments that you may not necessarily see with the naked eye. Uh, so I have to say the 4K 120, it's, it, it was a really fun thing to use on the Z9. <laughs> I got, I'm with you right there. 8K definitely has its purposes, but in terms of more of an everyday type usage, the 4K 60 and the 4K 120 for me are way, way more in my wheelhouse. I'm, I'm really looking forward to shooting uh, a lot more with them in the future. Now, I, I got to ask you, because one of the things that when you gave me the camera back after you you had your your time with it one of the things you were most impressed with and christian and i just talked about this and he uh, echoed the same thing wasn't yes it was the speed yes it was the resolution yes you were you were you loved all of that but one of the things that you were like chris you didn't tell me about this you didn't tell me about the evf what what's going on how amazing is that evf oh my god and when i told you that the resolution was technically the same as the uh, as the z7 ii you I, I i i'm pretty sure i can put words in your mouth by saying you did not believe me <laughs> <laughs> i remember that exact moment actually <laughs> uh yeah what um because uh, the day I got the Z9, actually, the first thing that I did was, um, well, I, I, I got myself familiar with the Z9, but that was during the day. But I then actually went straight up to Algonquin Park to do some night photography. So that's actually the first time I actually did some shooting with the Z9, and that was at night. It just happened to be that way. So when I had the, the viewfinder, uh, when I was looking through the viewfinder at night, it's immediate difference that I noticed um, and what was so impressive is that I could actually see like the individual bright stars in the night sky, uh, those brighter ones that are shining out there. I actually saw them and I was able to pinpoint and focus right there on my viewfinder. Um, and it wasn't, you know, the, the same type of visibility compared to the Z7 II that I had right next to me. Um, the Z7 II tends to get a little bit noisy during uh, darker situations. so just there right there i was totally impressed um shooting in the night sky i can now actually see what i'm doing when i'm you know photographing uh low light at sunrise and things like that so uh, and as mentioned astrophotography is actually a really great uh, it's actually a really great tool for that now and um i couldn't believe it when you yeah when you mentioned it was the, I actually don't even know the specs right now, but uh, you mentioned it was similar specs to the Z7 II, and I was like, that can't be. It's so much different, and so the improvements are so vast. It's just crazy what they did internally to be able to manage that. Yep. Yeah, yeah. Resolution, it is the same, but it's a much brighter panel, so it's at 3,000 nits, when a lot of other cameras on the market are only 1,000 nits. So that brightness in certain conditions, whether it's a very high contrast scene or sometimes scenes like at night where you have very high point light sources, that actually extra brightness makes a huge, huge difference. And then that's not even talking about the no blackout with the, um, uh, the, the real live viewfinder, the dual stream that Christian and I went. No, that's not even considering that. That's, this is just the day-to-day -day usage. This is not talking about extreme sports and action. So yeah, there's a lot going on behind the scenes with the EVF that, uh, that people may not really realize until they actually pick the camera up and go through it. Now, I, I have a couple um, well, I, I, guess, I guess I have one more question. Well, we'll kind of slowly start to fade out. Um, but my one question is a multiple parter. So can you, in uh, I'll say the top two or top three um, features of the Z9, can you kind of lay those out for the people? Because every, every photographer that, that I kind of talk to um, uh, kind of has a, a different top three because there are so many of the cameras. Um, we're, we're, sorry, so many features of this particular camera. So can you kind of give me your top three features of the Z9 um, so that viewers at home kind of get a feeling for, for what you loved about the camera? Uh, yeah, definitely. Uh, I mentioned one of them, basically, the, the viewfinder experience. Um, the, the first thing that I noticed different about it was that, and it was just so impressive. Uh, like you mentioned with the, the no blackout as well when you're doing um, burst mode. Uh, very, very, um, very, very good improvement uh, in that respect. 
Uh, and the second one will probably be the frame rate as well, the 4K 120. Uh, that's um, video as well as uh, in stills mode, you get the 20 uh, frames per, per second RAW and 30 frames per second JPEGs and 120 uh, frames per second JPEGs as well. So all that combined uh, just totally amps up the creativity level and, and what you can do with the camera itself. Um, so I do like that. And I guess the final one might be something that I didn't mention yet. I don't think it was the, uh, the, uh, the LCD screen in the back mm. where you can actually flip from uh, landscape 90 degrees as well as portrait yes. 90 degrees. Yes. And that was something that I've been asking for since the Z7 came out was, why couldn't I do 90 degrees on the portrait <laughs> side? Because I always, there are many times when I actually hold the camera to the side like that in portrait mode. And I'm sure for videographers that matters a lot too. So I'm very, I'm very, very thankful that uh, you've enabled that into the Z9 now. So awesome. Yeah, those awesome. are my top three. Nice. Yeah, I, I, I love hearing what different photographers like about the camera because it, it does really kind of help differentiate me as to what the important features are for for a lot of uh, consumers out there, for a lot of the viewers, and the cool thing that I'm finding is that almost everybody has a different answer. And like, if you ask about the D6, it's gonna be one of two things. If you ask about the Z7 II, it's gonna be one of two things. But I've talked to a number of photographers now who've been able to get their hands on this, and almost every single one of them uh, has had different things. Yeah, there's obviously some overlap, but it is such a versatile camera that it's just unbelievable. Yeah, yeah, you said it. Um, the versatility is, that's the biggest advantage, I think, of the Z9 is it's capable of doing pretty much anything you uh, put to, put to its task. So uh, I think not just myself, but anybody, whether you're, uh, you know, sports, uh, photojournalist, uh, wedding photographers, even in nature and landscape and wildlife, they're all, it's, this camera is well suited for anybody in those genres. So um, it's just, yeah, I'm sure everybody will love it just as much as I did. <laughs> Well, let's, let's end it on that, uh, that, that amazing note. Uh, let's try and everybody get out and grab a, grab a Z9 as quick as you can. I know everybody wants to. Um, when they are uh, available and you do have them in your hands, I guarantee you will love it as much as not only Taku, not only myself, but also Christian as well. So uh, Taku, I'm going to say thank you very much for joining us today, uh, giving your thoughts on... Uh, on the Z9 to all the viewers at, uh, at Nikon TV, and I'll try and make sure to have you back as soon as I can. Talk to you later, thanks. Yeah, thanks so much, take care. All right, everybody. So I wanna say um, a big thank you myself to both Christian and Taku. I hope you guys were able to get a whole bunch of information from them. Uh, any comments or questions you have, make sure to throw them down below and they will definitely get back to you with some response about what they thought about the camera. If you have any comments or questions to me about the camera, absolutely throw them down there. That's what I'm here for, I'm here to answer. Um, now this is, uh, I'll say kind of part two of our Nikon TV episodes uh, centered right around our, our latest launches being the Z9. Now we are going to have additional episodes because we didn't just introduce the Z9. We also came out with new lenses. One of them being this right here, the Z100 to 400. So um, the next episode, keep an eye open for that. We are going to not only have um, Michael, uh, another one of our Nikon Canon ambassadors, go and talk about his experience with the Z9, but I will go and get into all of the Nikkor Z lenses that we also introduced at the exact same time. So until the ne next episode, everybody stay safe, and I'll see you then.